Well, good afternoon, Mark. Um, I'm joined by Mark Hogarth, who's Creative Director of Harris Tweed Hebrides in Scotland. We're actually in London. We're in uh, Covent Garden, very near Covent Garden at uh, Walker Slater's store, um, where we are surrounded by what I call a new look, um, which Mark has explained is the return of the preppy look, which is very welcome for all, all branches of the wool textile industry. But Mark, you're from Scotland. You work at Harris Tweed Hebrides. Many years ago, Harris Tweed was in, a, was in a difficult situation. We wondered what the future would be, and I think that was about 2006. But since then, there's been a, a significant revival of Harris Tweed as a fashion item, as an ecological item. Can you just tell us a little bit about how that began to turn around? Well, I think sometimes with, uh, with heritage uh, products, particularly in the textiles industry, it does take a particular uh, low point and a deer as it was with Harris Tweed before people realised you know what you had which was not just the end product which is obviously this fine cloth mm. but you've got an entire community uh, and whole area of Scotland the Outer Hebrides which has Harris Tweed integral to uh, the cultural fabric uh, of those islands and I think also the economic crash of 2007-2008 mm. made people realise that there was an intrinsic value and not just a financial value to buying products. At that point, I think brands and logos um, dominated the fashion industry. And I think Harris Tweed provided something with a, with a story, uh, something where there was a unique process mm -hmm. and obviously based on wool, which we knew at that time, and particularly you knew, uh, was the most remarkable, renewable uh, natural fibre out there. So I think a few things came together and uh, we started very subtly to, uh, to promote the fabric uh, through, through Brian Wilson, uh, Ian Angus McKenzie and Ian Taylor who started the new mill which was Harris Tweed Hebrides. Mm -hmm. Take me back a bit to the 19th century. Harris Tweed has always been woven on the island since what, 1850 something like that? Yeah, 1840s. Uh, 18, 1840s. Yeah. You managed to uh, conserve your heritage and your brand mm. whereas I would say some others in Scotland haven't. Uh, they've lost the brand to become a generic. You haven't. How did that happen? I think needs must, uh, Peter. And uh, you had this incredible uh, provenance and heritage. But I think the Harris Tweed Authority, which was uh, first constituted in 1909, really put that mark on. Mm -hmm. And that was to differentiate Harris Tweed from you know, the, the border tweeds in Scotland, the, the northern tweeds, mm -hmm. the Yorkshire tweeds. Uh, of course, the, um, the story goes that it was actually a London tailor's mistake uh, who had this fabric arrive yeah, and yeah. put it down to, to uh, you know, it was Harris Tweel and they put it down to Harris Tweed. Mm -hmm. Hence yeah. the relationship between uh, the Tweed River and of course Harris Tweed. But the name stuck. But more importantly, I think the Harris Tweed Authority or the Harris Tweed Organisation, as it was in that early part of the 19th century, put those rules in uh, that it had to be made in Outer Hebrides at the home of the weaver mm -hmm. from virgin wool. And I think once you have that protection in, you can only build upon it. And I think as the 20th century progressed and indeed the popularity of Harris Tweed progressed, then uh, the differentiation, the distinction, uh, backed by, of course, the, the orb That's, was, yeah. was there. And the orb mark is stamped on the fabric when it, when it goes through the finishing? It is, and uh, it's a very traditional uh, thing to do, but until that stamp, it's actually stamped uh, once on the front of the fabric, three times on the back, along a typical 50 metre length of fabric. And it's not until that point that the Harris Tweed Authority, an independent auditor, if you like, has stamped the tweed, that it becomes Harris Tweed rather than just a bit of tweed cloth. Going back to the 1970s and 80s when I worked with Harris Tweed, there was in, in New York, Harris Tweed came in at a very, uh, at a very preferential duty mm -hmm. of around 15% compared to 38% for other fabrics. And it was because it was hand-woven. Mm -hmm. Is this still the case? It is still the case. I think that the, some of those duties have come down. There's a remarkable story which uh, we've actually researched into with Brian Wilson. And uh, the duty was specific. So in every trade agreement by the United States, Harris Tweed is mentioned as an exception because it is hand-woven, and being hand-woven, and being the size that it is, which is relatively small, it was never going to endanger the, uh, the domestic textile industry of the United States. So as many other aspects of Harris Tweed, it was a unique 
uh, nature. I think uh, there was a lot of lobbying done by a, fav uh, a very famous uh, and redeemed uh, Hebridean minister, uh, yes. church minister, ah. who garnered support in the Carolinas and then took his, uh, his lobbying skills mm -hmm. to Washington, D.C. and managed to get that put through, I think, in the, the late 1950s or early 1960s. We're seeing a revival of uh, the Tweedy look mm -hmm. in this store. It's a perfect example. Um, is that Tweedy look being replicated elsewhere in the world in your export markets? It, it, it is, and in fascinating fashion, it is inconsistent. You know, mm -hmm. it, what's happening in Korea is slightly different to what's happening in, in Japan. True. What's happening in the in the US, uh, driven by you know obviously uh, culture and uh, Hollywood and pop artists, slightly different to what is happening in Europe, which is a little bit more of a traditional take. Mm -hmm. But I mean. I'm sure you're very aware of uh, what happened with the Ivy style, which became, you know, the preppy style, and then it just keeps reinventing itself in different manners. I've noticed that the, the Ralph Lauren look is very mm -hmm. much around at the moment, and the Ralph Lauren is very, very eclectic. Yeah. Um, in other ter terms of men's, in, in terms of men's fashion, a tweed jacket look often goes with a woolen knitwear. Look. Yeah. Um, and we've seen during the pandemic that knitwear sales soared. Yeah. Um, how do you explain that? Yeah, well. I think the, the background of it is fascinating. So without getting too much into the history, and this is very much a lockdown project, but I, I read up on it. Why was Ivy still in, you know, why was Harris Tweed and indeed the Shetland jumper, mm -hmm. fair Isle jumper, intrinsic? And it goes back to those Ivy uh, League campuses, most of which were you know, brick, uh, no central heating, right. and in the middle of forests. So they were cold and they were dark, a little bit like parts of Scotland or even Yorkshire. And uh, it was it was a uh, it was function before fashion, but of course function and fashion sometimes they, they embrace each other, and and I think that has stayed to this day, uh, that incredible balance of colours that you do get with the woven, and and the woolen, and uh, I, whether you you match match that up, or indeed as some people do clash it up, I think the the spectrum, uh, and also the ability for people in a fashion forward sense. Uh, to really make a statement with uh, the, with the colours of the woolens and obviously tweed, and again, it's function. You know, you can be as warm uh, or as cool as you want, because as we know, wool's just such a wonderful, breathable fabric. Sure, as we're saying now, with with, a, with an, an energy crisis, the newspapers in the UK this morning are telling us to wear knitwear, to wear jackets. So, with the energy crisis, wool is going to come into its own this, in, in the northern hemisphere this uh, 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 this winter. I mean, it, it really is. Uh, I think that the term they're using is warm robe. So, uh, you know, it's what, what's going to keep you, you, you warm. I think being warm, wearing tweeds is the easy part. It's how you layer up, which is particularly important. And also, that's a functional dimension. But I think the people that want to do that and get their layering right, there's a fashion dynamic to, to this as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where companies like uh, Walker Slater all the way um, towards the, the streetwear end of the spectrum and up to the tailoring, uh, you know, whether you do a three-piece suit or whether you put a, a thin merino jumper uh, against your, your tweed. There's a bandwidth of wool where I don't think, there probably always was, but not with such a choice and not, not with such quality now. During the pandemic, it was said that the suit was dead, but I'm looking around me here, the suit's everywhere. Yeah. Um, is the suit going to continue in a... Absolutely. I think the suit is back. Uh, the only thing that's changed is uh, the, the differentiation of the suit. You know, whether you go full tailored or whether you, you break it down uh, you know, and uh, do more of a, what I would call the media look, which would be a, like a grandpa collar shirt mm -hmm. uh, or even a t-shirt uh, with a pair of, pair of soft shoes. I think the suit is a uniform and, and, and whether we like to admit it or not, we do quite like uniforms as, as human beings. Sure. Isn't it ironic how, you know, dressed down Friday uh, got turned on its head during the pandemic where people were having dress up Friday mm -hmm. uh, because they were sick of running about in leisure wear and pyjamas. Yeah, indeed. China is a massive market for many wool textile companies and China as a supplier is a very important part of the, of the supply chain. Uh, how is China for Harris Tweed? Uh, it's growing, which is great. Uh, and over the, the last decade, we're just beginning to see a little bit more in, uh, interest. Uh, from my limited uh, knowledge, you could 
probably advise me on this. I know that you know, the merino wools and the, the softer, lighter wools have always had a higher sense of popularity. Harris is obviously thick, but it's functional. But I do think the, uh, the heritage and the provenance, mm. uh, our, our unique story, is beginning to uh, you know, pay dividends and uh, the order book is certainly looking much stronger. There are climatic similarities between China and Korea, and I noticed that Korea mm. has always been a very strong market for yep. Harris Street. So one suspects that northern China, yep. uh, the towns of Harbin and Beijing, and yep. uh, right to the north where it's a cold Manchurian wind coming down, yep. the Tweedy look could be very, very popular indeed. Yeah, it's, there's a very strong fashion industry in uh, Korea, and those young designers, many of whom come possibly to St. Martin's or the Royal College here in London, mm. goldsmiths, take their, their knowledge and skills back. But what is uh, what remains with them from their time in the, the UK and other European institutions is uh, an appreciation and a knowledge of uh, British textiles. And I think that's where we are beginning to uh, really benefit from, from that. What I like about the Korean fashion industry, they really appreciate uh, well-made uh, cloth and they, they really cut the fabric in a fantastic way, a mixture of tradition and modernity and they do it, they, they, they do it in a really, really unique sense uh, of style and most of the Harris Tweed uh, you know, that, that is used in Korea and consumed uh, is in the luxury uh, and premium sector. Now you've seen this market replicated in China? I think in, slowly. In, in the smart northern it, cities? Yes, absolutely. Smart, uh, particularly around um, Shanghai and Beijing, we're beginning to see uh, you know, really interesting uh, tailoring done with, with Harris Tweed. Uh, now, that might not be in the, trade, it's the sense of the traditional suit. It could be a, a taken a bomber jacket, mm. but, but it's tailoring none, nonetheless. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.